from I'm Prashant from uh, Center for Robotics Research. So my whole life is um, working on um, questions uh, to do with robots, uh, how they can move around and do useful things uh, in households, uh, outdoors, and things like that. And then uh, the the whole question starts from the fact that we cannot, none of the robots we know of cannot do any of these things. We don't know why. Uh, so we thought in 1980s that, uh, you know the history of robotics, right? So the, you sh uh, have you heard of Rossum's Universal Robots drama? Uh, so that is where roughly the thing started. So uh, in, um, in the um, 18th century uh, slavery, uh, and then people were talking about this popular uprising against slavery. And then um, artists and technici tech engineers basically, uh, in parallel, thought about solutions. And then artists uh, were head of really engineers. And artists uh, said, okay, so uh, how about in the future, we have machines that look like humans, and those machines can do things the slaves are doing, uh, okay, we find a solution for slavery. We don't need human slaves anymore. We can have human and robots, okay, <laughs> machines that look like humans can do this. And then Karl Kopeck was a Czech uh, person uh, who, who uh, you know, cre uh, did this drama, Rossum's Universal Robot. Uh, he found the closest word for slavery in Czech language, uh, robot. Right, so a robot is like worker, work, work, uh, things like that. So he said, okay, so this guy, this machine will be a robot. Uh, uh, and then, then uh, engineers picked up on this idea. And then later, in 1950s, uh, we had our inaugural meeting in 1956, the Dart, famous Dartmouth Conference where um, famous scientists got together uh, and then coined the term artificial intelligence. That is where in the Dartmouth conference, uh, the first uh, term artificial intelligence came. The people who organized this Dartmouth conference went to um, uh, form three centers uh, that worked as the pillars of robotics and artificial intelligence. One is MIT uh, Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, the second is Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute. So these are the three pillars of whole thing. And then it spread to the whole world. So this is, uh, have you seen the um, um, Ex Machina? <laughs> this is a sci-fi movie uh, that came recently. Uh, and then this is a robot, she is a robot, and this is a real human. Uh, and then she looks robotic, right? So you can see the metallic parts in her. And then the whole point is, they are doing a Turing, t doing a Turing test in a different way. Uh, so uh, the, the owner of this robot, he is the owner of the robot, and that is the subject. And then they are asking the question um, whether that robot can cheat a human knowing, <laughs> right? The human knows pretty well that this is a robot. Cheat a human to be a real partner, and then can, can she make a human fall in love with her and then trust her? So, and uh, the whole story is about that. I'm not going to tell you what happened. Uh, so, uh, like, um, that's the whole story. It's a pretty, for me, it was a pretty exciting question to ask. When you know it is a machine, can you make a human fall in love with you? Right? So this is the world we are envisioning in the future. Uh, humans and robots, when we live together, what would happen? What, what will happen to our fundamentals uh, about being human? Right? So uh, um, this is another, this is a, like a very cheap robot. This is called the hex bug. Uh, you can buy from the science museum, like four pounds or I think five pounds, a kit. Uh, so you can, you can say, do you think these robots are have sensors and processors and some kind of way to know where they are? They just behave like cockroaches, right? 
So what, what, what is your guess? Just, I just want to know what your guess is. What level of intelligence would they have? Do, you, do they have sensors? Do they have, uh, yeah? Okay. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. There's no degree of cognition by any judgment. Okay. In the function. Yeah, but do you think they have sensors? Yes, obviously. Yeah, they clearly got. Uh, do you think they have processors? Any kind of electronic uh, processing of those sensors? I imagine they have a very simple level, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Any guesses? Well, they must have uh, something that tells them when they run into something. I see. Okay. And the process must then be uh, <coughs> going to reverse and perhaps change angle. Uh, okay. And, and then get people going forward again. Yeah, I would. I would say. I. I. I would imagine all of you thought. Okay, it should have some primitive sensing. Okay? Mm -hmm. This robot, in fact, have none. No sensing at all. No processing at all. This is just a piece of rubber, silicon rubber with a vibrator. So they really need these uh, walls to bounce again. So without these walls, they won't do anything. They will be just, you know, rolling around, right? So they just bump onto these walls and bounce back and hit the other wall, and that's all what they do, right? So in robotics, what is important is what the robot can make in your mind than what the robot is, really. Okay, it is like a projected consciousness. So you assign some some uh, consciousness or some uh, level of intelligence to the robot that the robot never had. Okay, it is you assigning that, you thinking that the robot has these senses, has these processes, and has this level of thing, which is the most important thing uh, in a human robot uh, relationship for us, right? So you don't need to have what the robot, robot to have what you think it has. You can play with it, right? So a child would play with these uh, robots thinking that they are creatures. But that is fine for this toy manufacturing company. And which is, which is much, much better than having a very intelligent um, a robot which is too expensive, and this is just four pounds, right? So you can basically literally walk to the, uh, the science museum and then you can, you can just buy it. Right? So it's a ceiling and rubber, vibrators. I right? use a wristwatch battery uh, and that's it. So these legs are designed so that these vibrations uh, propagate through these legs and then uh, hit the ground in the right angle so that it will be, pro you know, there's a propulsion force forward in, the, in, in some kind of a sensible manner. So they are, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah, ah, yes, there's no line, the line is in your mind, okay, so if you, if you cross the line, oh, yeah, 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 so maybe I biased you, so if I said this is a toy, and then what do you think it is, yeah, it would be a better question, so yeah, it's fine, so that's, that's great, so really, uh, whether it is just a piece of rubber, or whether it is a robot, is just in your mind. Okay, so that's that's what is important for us. Uh, so, uh, uh, but that's that's really the central central question. Okay, there's no definition. Uh, we cannot define. So these dogs, for example, they come from the same factory, Sony. They they <laughs> stop manufacturing. That's a different story. So red team and the blue team they are playing soccer. So, uh, and then uh, uh, they learn to play the game, and they're not programmed in any way uh, to do anything. So they just learn, okay? Uh, and then you can see the, some what, like the red, you can see from how they pick the ball, uh, one team has learned to be better than the other team. So there's, see, he, he used the head. He could have used hands, legs. He used the head because that is the most sensible thing to do at that point. Uh, so somebody watching these dogs might come to various conclusions. And the prediction is, 
your conclusion will be completely, or at least slightly different from his conclusion. Okay, so it is in the eyes of the observer. The whole thing about uh, uh, intelligence is in the eyes of the observer. It is. It is not. It is not. You cannot. You cannot point at uh, a processor, a sensor, a body, or anything. It is. It is. It is. It is coming from the environment and uh, the the circuitry and the embodiment. You cannot say really separate out and say, okay, this is the part that really decides <laughs> the intelligence. It is. It is a full orchestration in your mind. Okay. So, which is true for another human to like, I think that person is that. It is in my mind. It is. It is. It may not be true. <laughs> so it is true. And so this um, Atlas robot, uh, you know, Google bought Boston Dynamics, uh, and then Boston Dynamics uh, uh, tested several. So now robots have come to this point. They can open a door without falling, and this was a big problem for decades. And now they can walk on snow bipedal, like humans. Uh, and then they can sleep and they can recover. Right? So uh, you, might, you might, if you haven't seen, uh, have you seen the video, <laughs> Epic Failures, after the Zarpa Challenge, right? So uh, that, like after Fukushima disaster, at Fukushima disaster, we, we were shocked. We have worked in robotics for so many years, we don't have a solution for this disaster. World of robotics got really shocked. And then they, the DARPA um, declared a grand challenge. It doesn't matter, you don't have to be American. It can be anybody in this world. <laughs> Come up with your best robot and then do few, few very specific things like driving a car, getting out of the car, and then you know, or using a tool to drill and then open a door and things like that. All, all of us failed, and I, we, I, our team was the only British team to go at least to the qualifying stage, and then, then, then we failed at the second stage. And there were three European, uh, including us, three European Germans and um, a Spanish uh, group that went, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, and everybody failed. Uh, on the, the, the winners were South, South Korean um, Korea Advanced Institute of Technology, right? Um, and then um, after just about one year later, Atlas Boston Dynamics launched this robot just two weeks ago, just two weeks ago. It, it surprised, it sent shockwaves around the whole robotics world. We, nobody thought within one year we could come from there to there this place. Uh, uh, the, 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 the speculation is that after that challenge, the whole world gathered and then we shared information and then that uh, we did massive tests and all those information went to DARPA and then the, the, this is the DARPA funded uh, uh, Boston Dynamics. Uh, now Google owns this kind of robots. So, uh, so that, that, is, that is great for us. So on the other end, on the pers personal computer market, uh, so a French company launched this uh, buddy robot. Um, so the Blue Frog Robotics, if you look for, this is now out for uh, marketing, and then this is cheap. It is about 600 euros. You can pre-order. I'm not a sales agent for them. <laughs> uh, and then it can do very basic things like you know, monitoring your house. With the, you, can, you can, through your phone, ask the robot to go and check whether I switched off the oven um, and things like that, and then patrol around to see if there's any intruders. And it's like, so basically reminding you things and then helping you to cook and things like that. So this consumer robotics industry is now fast progressing. On, on one side, okay? Um, <clears throat> so if you go to Automatica, which is held once a year, uh, you can see other developments like wearable robots, soft robots, um, uh, right? And then bionic arms, like, so have you seen B Bionic, a UK-based company? Uh, so you, you, for, it's the amputation. So you can amputate, uh, you, you, you can have a prosthetic arm, you can control using your own brain. 
uh, that, that hand, right? So I, I met that uh, one of those uh, beneficiaries. We had a panel discussion recently at the London Underground Film Club before uh, screening the Blade Runner. Uh, so I, I was surprised to see how she controlled her fingers. Uh, you can handshake with her, and then she can do a very smooth, very soft um, handshake. Uh, using just uh, muscles, uh, EMGs amplified to motors. Uh, so these things are really coming up. And then if you ask her, uh, does she feel that it is a prosthetic arm? She says no. It is part of her body, right? It is part of her body. It, like, you have to be really careful when you touch that hand. You might think it is a piece of technology, right? And for her... It is her hand. You are touching her fingers. Okay? So this is a w w consciousness. <laughs> okay? So consciousness projected to a lifeless thing. Okay? Uh, so this, uh, uh, so this is what we did. And then, well, okay, so this is an important thing I want to focus on now. Um, you might think a robot needs a brain, a processor, sensors to do meaningful things. So this robot, and Irvina's robot, see, so you just push it down a ramp, it walks like a, roughly like a human without a single sensor, single uh, processor. Just joints, just falling down a ramp, just like a, a thing. This is a dead fish. This fish uh, is a dead body. And then, but if you put it against a water stream, it swims like a live fish. Okay? So what does it mean? Most of our behaviors are bodily functions than brain-driven functions. Uh, so we call, I call it morphological computation. That means the computation happens in mechanical circuits together with the environmental circuits together. And then you can just yoke or like, you know, zip your bodily circuits with the environmental circuits if you have the right bodily match with the environment. So if you put a ribbon here, it will flow down, okay? If you put a stick here, it will flow down. But the fish body, fish body swims forward because it has the right stiffness distribution, right? That can come into a useful or meaningful communication, conversation with the turbulence in the environment, okay? So the statistics of the turbulence can talk to the body, and then the body can talk to the statistics of the turbulence, and then they, they talk to each other in a meaningful way without any kind of consciousness. And then that moves forward, okay? There's this evidence. <clears throat> so, um, and in, at the level of the brain, uh, Jitsa at MIT in 1991 did a very useful experiment that really changed <laughs> our way of thinking, the brain. So he took a spinalized frog, and then he stimulated a site A, right, on the spinal cord, stimulated site A, and then he put the frog's leg in different places before stimulating. He observed the amazing thing. No matter where you put it, you stimulate site A, it gets attracted to point A all the time. One point, right, one point. We call it a force field because it doesn't matter where you are, it gets attracted to that, okay? And then side B, it gets attracted to another point B, okay? And then the amazing thing, if you stimulate side A and B together in various combinations, the movement of the, the leg is a linear summation of these two original fields, okay? So a linear summation is like this. I have a string to this, and then I ask you to pull it, it'll pull that way. I have another string, I ask you to pull it, and it'll move that way. So that is like the force field A, force field B. If I ask both of you to pull now the two strings, it won't go that way, it won't go that way, it'll go that way. So that's a linear summation of these two force fields, okay? So the, the, the higher, the, high, the, the the idea came that, okay, so we, the, all our smooth movements we are making are just, just a, a, like a symphony coming from discrete players in the brain. 
right? It is, it is like, it is like um, you, you have this uh, musical uh, kind of thing, violining, uh, C-list. When they play together, you hear music, but it's an orchestration, right? It is coming from finite circuits in the brain. It is not like you are making a very complex movement. It is not like that. Maybe uh, for all your movements, maybe 10, 10 circuits are enough to make very complex movements. Okay, so we do that in robotics a lot. Um, let's say uh, in, robo in robotics, let's say I have a I have an obstacle and I have a goal there and then I have my robot there and then if I have a force field that, that attracts to the goal, one force field, no matter where I put the robot it will get attracted to that goal. Okay. And then I have another force field t saying, okay, if, I, if, you, if you see a, a obstacle using a sonar sensor or something, uh, activate this, this vortex force field. Then when, if, if, if these two uh, force fields are running in parallel, depending on the sensor feedback, uh, it will have linear combinations, okay? So depending on where they are, like if it is here, it has a, uh, it has a attraction field that way, uh, a repulsion force from the obstacle that way, the robot will move this way, right? And then when the robot comes from here, what will happen is because of these vector summations, it will avoid the obstacle and then go to the, go to the target um, and then you might think, oh, the robot had a lot of intelligence, okay? Because you don't do the summation in your brain, right? You just watch how the robot is uh, behaving, and then you might think that it is uh, having some intelligence. Uh, <clears throat> All right? Um, and then it is just coming from these two uh, fields. I can uh, program it to the robot, and then I can ask, okay, so it behaves reasonably well. So that is uh, what we are interested in. So if you look at our own evolution, uh, biologists, evolutionary biologists say, so it took about 18 million years, like, so like great apes, our uh, immediate ancestors about 80 million years ago. And then man, the evidence is like roughly 4 million to 2.5 million year window uh, to see Homo sapien uh, type of... Sorry. They are from Pithecus, 2.5 million. Yeah. Not the Homo sapiens. Not the Homo sapiens. Uh, as Homo sapiens? 60,000 years ago. Oh, right. So it is like Neanderthals and uh, uh, Erectus. Like the humans, but in between the oh. human, Okay, you mean yeah, yeah. even yeah. recent as 60,000 years ago, uh, humans. Okay, so uh, our kind of idea, okay, we put all of them together <laughs> to uh, be like human. Uh, basically, uh, apes who could walk, bipedal. Uh, so uh, we don't know how much intelligence or whatever we had, so they could uh, walk bipedal very often, <laughs> more often than quadrupedo. Uh, so uh, why did it take that much long uh, in that evolution? And then after that, things uh, uh, about the mind started pretty fast, like just 10,000 years ago, we had evidence of farming. Uh, farming is about asking the question whether uh, uh, what I do uh, by going to the jungle, uh, can I do it in my backyard? So move your mango tree to the backyard, move your animals, whatever interested, into the backyard. So can I keep them here than going there? Effectively, what I'm doing is, I'm going to the jungle, doing the same thing, and then can I do the same thing in a different way? And then about 5,000 years ago, so just uh, writing, 
it is another question. Okay, do I have to keep everything in my mind? Can I put it down other than the my the brain? Uh, and then they got the idea. Okay, so a, a concept can be mapped to a 3D shape, which is a, a knot system using straws. And then if we have an agreement among ourselves, that 3D shape can be remapped to the concept. Uh, and one to uh, yeah, many to one and one to many kind of thing, and that revolutionized the whole thing <laughs> about how, how we do things. And then computer-aided manufacturing less than 100 years ago, um, uh, internet about 25 years ago, uh, a robot that can walk just two weeks ago. Um, right? <laughs> so we, <laughs> we are in, 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 a, in a really steep up, uphill. At, uh, we, I really don't know what will happen uh, next month. So that is, that, is, uh, that is the stage we are in. Uh, so <clears throat> now the thing is, the important thing to remember is this. Simple things to do with mobility and perception uh, took a long time for the evolution to perfect. And that is throughout uh, the foundation level of intelligence. So we might think that the mind is the most, the center of uh, intelligence. Uh, but we have other, I mean, it happened in the robotics history. We thought, okay, so if we have supercomputers, we can do great robots. But it was wrong. <laughs> and we made robots and then they fell. And then we couldn't get it to walk till we understood the physics and the embodiment. And then the body, uh, it, it, uh, you know, proved to be the bottleneck. Um, okay, I, I can share these slides with you. Don't worry about it. So, um, okay, so this is, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a few things my lab is doing. <laughs> so have you seen the goat, like, you know, climbing up these uh, cliffs like this? Uh, it's pretty amazing, right? their ability, right? So now the question comes, right? So just like that field, I really don't know what is going on in, in the goat. Is it uh, something to do with brain, the skeleton? Uh, you know, they are relaxing on top of trees, right? <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> we would, they are relaxing. They are not, like, doing anything <laughs> dangerous. They just relax there. Uh, so, I mean, what, what is happening? So, uh, our, our first world I didn't understand. And then if we have anything, any clues from this, we will make super smart robots. So... Uh, one group at Harvard tested the EMGs, the muscles, and activities, and they, they thought. And then we in, uh, here thought in a different way. We thought, okay, the secret is in the hoof, right? And then we made a 3D printed hoof with um, a different joints, nine joints, and then we uh, had different hypotheses about each joint. Uh, and then we tested, and then we found out that uh, the mechanical circuits that propagate vibrations from one slip, you know, if you slip, it creates a vibration and then it propagates and then it, it bounces back like an ABS system. And then that makes, um, you know, auto brake system in a car, right? And that makes this hoof, uh, the work you have to do to push this uh, hoof is three times, at least three times, uh, the work you have to do to push a rounded foot uh, on the same surface with the same weight. Okay, so just let's say a round foot, you push, you have some work to do, energy, and then you suddenly have this hoof, you cannot, you cannot push it, right? It gets stuck, okay? And then meaning uh, a, a big part of stability is just coming from the hoof, and then maybe the brain doesn't have to do anything, okay? Uh, so uh, this is a finding, like we, we are going to... Um, Kind of open, like this is not published yet, like this uh, just a few weeks old. Um, another project we are doing is like how a, how a robot could hold a delicate thing like a hamster. So we, we cannot. <laughs> none, none of the robots today uh, you can trust to hold a hamster, right? They will kill it uh, because if the hamster tries to escape, like it'll squeeze it like that, and then that's it. And But you can do it, right? So. Uh, how are you managing that, right? So then we did so many, so this is our hamster. So we have a bicycle tire tube inflating randomly, right? The inflating and deflating randomly, <coughs> and then we get a robot to learn it. 
And then we tested different hypotheses about how it might be uh, doing this. And then we found out that it, uh, if you have some kind of idea about the future probability of failure, you can effectively manage a uncertain object. You're not responding to current slips or whatever the things you are experiencing. Whatever the things you are experiencing about the instability it goes to an internal model that enables you to predict what might happen in the future. Uh, so mathematically, we call it expected time to failure. And then if your expected time to failure is always in the future, you know it is going to fail, but it is in the future all the time, right? Then it is not going to fail. That is how you walk, and that is, how you, uh, that is our basic hypothesis about uh, how we deal with the uncertain world. Right? So you walk on snow knowing that there's a chance of falling, but you don't, you, you don't stop from walking. If you always postpone that failure point to the future, and then you survive. Right? So um, uh, again, another uh, experiment about the knee joint. Uh, so we understand how the knee joint is computing the stability, uh, a, a big function about efficiency of walking. And I'm not going into details of that, um, uh, but I'm just telling you the body is really, really important uh, in the computation, uh, and then that, that projects us as uh, intelligent beings. Okay? Uh, so, okay. So it is like the body, the environment, the control system, which is the brain, as an integral system than a separated pieces. Uh, it's one circuit, basically, uh, that completes an intelligent being. Uh, so as, at a bodily level. But we really don't know, right? uh, okay, so about any autonomy. So I want to do a quick uh, experiment. Um, what do you think in your body you can control? Can you control the heart? Can you control the kidneys? No. Uh, spleen, intestines, how they digest, how you breathe? Can you control? Yes. One can regulate it with its muscular to an extent, so you can slow your breathing or you can control the breathing. Okay. So, right. How about a Parkinson's patient? Um, obviously, less for them because there's not as so much muscular control. Yeah. With regard to things like Mm. Uh, obviously, it's, there's not as much control there. There's, um, I mean, the heart is a muscle. Obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's a tricky, control. tricky thing. You, you can control your heart to a certain extent uh -huh. because people who compete in biathlon, uh -huh. which is cross country skiing yeah. plus rifle shooting, yeah. have to. Uh, go from a state where yeah, they are yeah. doing extreme aerobic exercise yeah, yeah. to a state where they have to be very steady. Right. Yeah. And, but and so you can actually train. Exactly. That. that you can train. Yeah. You can train. Train a system fine. Yeah. Right. So, but instantly, uh, you cannot take control over something. In your, yes. Right. Somehow you can because indirectly, because <coughs> if you want to enhance. The heartbeat. Mm. As for me, if I went there, mm -hmm. at the edge of the window, yeah. since I suffer from from vertigo, yeah, yeah, so, so, so. my heartbeat surely yeah. will enhance it. So, so it is not you controlling it; it is the situation that drives the system. Indirectly. Okay. Yeah, indirectly. Yes, yes. So it is the situation that drives it. So let's say we we think that we can think, right? So if we can think, we should be able to stop thinking. So can you stop thinking for one second? No, right? Then who is thinking? Are you thinking when you're asleep? Not, we do, we do. So because we, we, we cannot stop thinking, the thinking process, the thought process continues. So... Well, no, I'm going to ask you, can yeah. you prove that you're still, still thinking when you're asleep? Oh, I can prove because, like, uh, when I wake up, I have memories of what certain memories of what ha what I thought during sleep, maybe okay, dreams. But, yes, but was that all the time you were asleep, or was it? Ah, uh, no. Yeah, yeah we don't see, have. Uh, yeah. What I'm going to suggest is that yeah. 
this is a bit like your, your Godel's theorem. You, you can't actually, I, I think it does become possible to prove that you're not thinking. Mm -hmm. No, it, it is like uh, finding uh, a thinker, thinking is a process. Uh, finding a, 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 a thing that thinks, uh, that, 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 is, that, is the, that is the problem. Uh, so, uh, like, m for machines, um, autonomy is a big uh, open question. So, what is autonomous? Like, uh, a machine is autonomous, like, I mean, there's no definition. Uh, this is my definition. <laughs> uh, if a computational resources to map a situation to an action without any outside interference. Uh, so, this uh, definition uh, still uh, stands okay. <laughs> like, there's no huge opposition to that. So the, but this is how I define it. Action includes uh, changing control parameters inside, uh, the change in the programs inside, uh, or taking forces, movements, uh, camouflaging, and all those things are actions. Right? Uh, so it's a, I mean, this is not a perfect thing, but it's a pretty uh, okay thing. <clears throat> and then programs do not have to be software. So algorithmic, right? So if pressure is more than a set threshold, then start detonation process in a landmine, which is a, you know, the vicious, most vicious thing we can find. Um, it can be mechanical. The same algorithm can be implemented using a mechanical spring. So uh, it can be a complete body circuit, bodily circuit. It doesn't have to be a mental or a numerical or neural circuit to do things. Uh, so th this is, this, I'm, I'm taking a big issue about this because in the United Nations, uh, all these debates, they tend to focus on codes, algorithms that are dangerous. I'm saying physical things can be dangerous, right? Uh, so, um, uh, okay, so <clears throat> in the brain we have all these uh, uh, circuitry and uh, sensory inputs um, uh, like are, for example, if, if the pain signal is too much, the pain signal itself can recruit the circuit. It, it <coughs> processes that uh, pain signal. Okay? So it takes a bypass through the spinal cord without telling the brain. And the brain gets to know about it later. So it is not some regulator, central regulator, deciding how to process things. It is the, it is the whole driven process, right? the pain. Your, your fear, driving the whole, uh, what circuit should process that, and then how it should be processed. So it is that we cannot find a thinker or regulator. So that is uh, when I come to the discussion of uh, Buddhism. Uh, so the Buddhism, the f uh, fundamental premise is we cannot find a central regulator. It is, that is called the anatta. The term anatta is come. So, so in Buddhism, um, um, I'm going a little into the consciousness uh, debate on Buddhism. So it says me a pure mental process, a kind like meditation, can change your hardware. <laughs> okay. Uh, so like when, when people meditate, uh, so they said um, the, the medial uh, prefrontal cortex and uh, posterior cingulate cortex. So these are um, responsible for mind wandering, like uh, default b uh, mode behavior. So you just, you just go there and then you just, your mind wanders around. When you meditate, they are, these activities go down. And uh, so mind wandering nature goes down. Uh, and then it, it, it stabilizes more. And then it depends on the type of medita meditation they are doing. Uh, so one is like a baseline white, and then green is choiceless awareness. Like, so you are aware of whatever that comes to your mind or the body. Uh, red is loving kindness, like you try to develop compassion, uh, purposely think about uh, compassionate uh, things. And then blue is just concentration, concentrating on uh, some breath or something. So what it does to your brain is different, right? So the mental process, the, what the mental process does to your brain is different. So that is <coughs> that. Is that. And then um, after just uh, uh, two weeks of meditation, uh, 11 hours of meditation, sorry, 11 hours of meditation, 
uh, of uh, body and mind awareness, which is called the vipassana meditation, which is like, so you first meditate on a, something like the breath um, uh, you, that you can feel. And when you feel that your mind has settled down, then you focus your attention on feelings and movements and things like that. Uh, and then you you uh, you notice you f- you try to find a regulator, and then when you the more the more you f- try to find it, and the more you don't find it, you come to the realization that there's no central regulator. These are all processes that is rising and passing away, and then that helps you to kind of let things go. So that that is the whole uh, Buddhist. Um, right. So the, the 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 notion that I control, I own, I that that is thought to be the tension source, and then when you realize that really I even if I want to I cannot control anything, and then it makes it easier for you to let go of things, uh, and then uh, so then that that helps uh, to kind of have tension free life. That that's the kind of thing. So um, so <clears throat> the consciousness um, in Buddhism is different from awareness. So in Buddhism it says. There is a thing called a still awareness, unborn, undying, un- getting, not getting old. So your awareness, uh, when you grow old, it doesn't grow old. Uh, you, you, when you were a child, you were aware, and then now you are aware. When you are very old, you are aware. That state is not going to grow old. That's, that's one. Consciousness is a derivative of awareness. When a sensory stimulus hits a sensory organ, it says the field of awareness warps when, when, when a sensory stimulus hits a sensor. And uh, the warping creates two sides. One is me, me the, who, me, the, me the one who feels, and then the other is the world I'm feeling, okay? uh, so, which is not there, really. It is just one system. Uh, but you create a, a, a ridge and say, okay, it's me, and then there. But uh, Buddhism says this ridge is not a fixed thing. It changes, wobbles around, and that, the, uh, that makes you uh, change, right? So the, the one you think you are is going to change. You change moods. You change the person you are thinking. Like, let's say right now, because you are here, I think I am a, a lecturer. <laughs> right? uh, so, and then when I go home, I think I am a, a, a parent. Uh, and then when I go to uh, the railway station, I think I am a passenger. So the world or the situation we are embedded in projects back to something called a feeling of I, uh, which is not certain at all. Uh, it keeps changing. Uh, angry me, uh, a peaceful me, uh, a happy me, everything changes depending on the environment. So uh, it's like that. So you see something and it passes away in your memory and then it creates somebody and a slight attitude, which is overlapped. And over time, okay, I have a refined idea about that bad guy and attitude. And then I have an enemy and an attitude, <laughs> okay? It keeps uh, refining, and that enemy and my stand, that is so refined. The, in Buddhism, it goes uh, this mental pro- 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 mental pro- proliferation. So the propancha process happens in, in uh, so fast, uh, so fast, it says. And then this pr- uh, path is not, not certain. Uh, so uh, uh, in Pali, in ancient Pali language, uh, Buddhism says this thing called consci- vinyana. Vinyana is like, jnana is awareness, vi is split, vi is a, is a, a vibhinna or vichinna, like a split awareness is called consciousness, vinyana. Uh, the Pali word for consciousness is vinyana, which is different from awareness. So, could you repeat the difference between awareness and consciousness? Okay, so awareness is like like that mesh, right? Which is which was there, undisturbed, and the consciousness is when the awareness makes a ridge, giving you the feeling of me and that. Okay, so. Right now, we are, not, we, are, we are conscious. We are conscious, we are not aware. So when you do meditation, when you go to deep meditation, you get to, to a state where you are aware, 
you know that it is the world and the body, everything is the same. So that is a more undisturbed state where you can see yourself as it is. Uh, it is the awareness. So self-consciousness. It's, it's, self-consciousness. Uh, you can call it, but the word consciousness, when, when it, whenever it comes, there is a me involved. Awareness doesn't have a me involved. Uh, it, it is just aware of everything, including me and the environment. Okay. Yes? If you have something like a, a disembodied consciousness. Yes. Where, take, for example, people who have routines, who yeah, still yeah. feel yeah. parts of their body and their mind, uh, yeah. physically or not there. How does that... Relate? Yeah. So whenever you have a feeling, you have a consciousness, uh, it, which, is, which is a derivative of that awareness. So you, 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 whenever you feel that there is something, uh, so it's very hard not to have consciousness without awareness. So it's like it has to be medita- you know, practiced through meditation to go back to that awareness and look back at yourself or your own consciousness, which is, which is pretty doable. I would say. <laughs> it doesn't have to relate to a physical object. Or no, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be purely, purely mental. Purely mental. So in Buddhism, mind is mind is a sensor. Uh, um, uh, Buddhism distinguishes like the physicality and mental, mental because mind can feel pain. Uh, purely mental thoughts can give you pain and comfort. Uh, so Buddhism doesn't uh, distinguish between bodily senses, five senses. Uh, ear, skin, eye, uh, you know, tongue, and all these uh, five senses. And then there's a sixth sensor, which is the mind. And then it says, you can be aware of the mind itself. If you train your mind, uh, if you train your awareness. <laughs> so, which is really difficult. I, I've been through this meditation now about five years uh, in the uh, thing. It is really difficult, I should tell you. Uh, it's, it's, and sometimes it is really frustrating to, to notice that I am inside me, I have very bad thoughts. Uh, like um, I have hatred, I have jealousy, uh, and I'm, you know, like sometimes it's shocking, like, oof, that is jealousy. <laughs> I didn't know that it was there, and then I thought I'm a good man. So, but you, the, the, the training is like, so, okay, you have to recognize that, and then just, just, just aware that, uh, be aware that it is there, and then you were not perfect. You don't, don't, don't think that you are perfect. So this is a different di- discussion. <laughs> we can. So it is sometimes it's uh, really um, uh, difficult to do. So the thing is, finally, but when you are bombarded uh, by sensors, five sensors, you have no clue about the projections. The, that and me, that and me, that and me, and then six, uh, six consciousnesses, right? So eye consciousness, ear consciousness, mind consciousness, tongue consciousness. You think that there is a me, because there's a collection of me's, uh, which is like a, uh, you can see, visualize like a, you know, um, butterflies in a net, uh, <laughs> which are projected, and then it looks like a real thing, real self, real me. But when you meditate, you realize that it is just projections. <laughs> and then uh, it is not really there. So, um, okay, so, um, and then the Buddhism says this, uh, this path is not very certain. From time to time, the same input can give you uh, like that combatant, that enemy. The, um, I, I gave this talk to uh, military people, so that is why I have this. <laughs> uh, to tell them that uh, your decisions uh, really can change from time to time. Uh, and it can be dangerous. Uh, drone operators, right? So, we, like, for, for those people who operate drones and then uh, launch missiles from robots, I, I'm, I want to tell them that you are doing a very dangerous thing because you are taking decisions based on cameras, right? Remote cameras. And then you see somebody on the ground, which is not clear, and then somebody holding a, let's say, um, a tube, you might see as a gun, and then you really don't know what is happening to your mind at that point. You, it's, it's between, you know, his life is like on your, on your fingertip, right? Uh, so, so we had a big discussion on this. Uh, yeah. Uh, ask a question. Uh, more than 50 years ago, Isaac Asimov mm. created the three laws of robotics. Yes. Has anybody succeeded in explaining how one could actually 
bring those laws into a robot that we're creating now. As the, the, the principle, you know, uh, of, of, of Asimov. That, of Asimov. Yeah. Or, or if we wanted to go back to uh, your military robots, mm. could you make a military robot that always obeyed the Geneva Convention? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, 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 the central theme we, we were discussing, um, no, the answer is no. You cannot guarantee... Uh, um, a, a Asimov law is not convex, we call it. It is, it is not blocking uh, without loopholes. Mm. Uh, so if we, if we look at like all this axiomatic derivation, Gordel's incompleteness yes, and, uh, theorem. As I remember, when yeah. Asimov did this, he, said yeah. he had this idea of a positronic brain, mm. and he was talking about potentials rather than logic. Exactly. And, and so I could see that it would fit yeah. with your ideas of potentials, mm -hmm. in, 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 exactly. at least by the call of the front bit, that it, it's all about your potential rather exactly. than uh, uh, absolute logic. Absolute, rules. yeah. So that, that's why I'm asking whether yeah, yeah, exactly. you looked it's, at it and said, it's, hey, you know, with, by using potentials, we could effectively build these principles in. Right, right, right. So uh, we, what, we, what we are now discussing is in that community, how do you define threat? How do you define an enemy? How do you, how do you, what is the measure? And then what is the assessment? And then given the time frame you have, you have to press that button, uh, like what should guide you? And then if you are maliciously pressing the button, what mechanisms are there uh, on the robot side to uh, or disobey? your command, things like that. We'll, we'll talk about these things uh, next time. Right? So next, 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 yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.